one of the third year, year um, Family Emerge residents. I uh, just want to thank uh, Dr. Matt Davis for being uh, my supervisor for this and also Dr. Stan Van Oom, who is an endocrinologist here uh, at St. Joe's uh, who deals with uh, hormone therapy, hypogonadism, and has been um, good value for uh, helping me produce uh, my grand rounds. So what my talk uh, is about, uh, it seems to be probably a bit unique to some, um, it's about anabolic androgenic steroids, uh, also known as what you thought steroids were before you learned about prednisone. Um, this talk kind of uh, stemmed from a few encounters I've had, one in particular when I was on cardiology uh, here in London. Uh, just a middle-aged man, actually he was been in the 40s, uh, had developed some chest pain, ended up having an end STEMI, no cardiac risk factors, uh, no family history, uh, ended up getting a PCI and uh, had pretty bad stenosis of his LAD. The only thing that was uh, kind of a red flag on his history was that he was taking anabolic steroids uh, at the time. So this kind of uh, spiraled into uh, what inspired uh, this grand rounds. Uh, so just an outline of this talk. Um, it's going to go over what the hell anabolic steroids even are, a bit of a history, its epidemiology, methods of abuse, its approach, and ED-related presentations. So what I can tell you right now off the bat is the research and evidence about uh, this type of steroid and disease is actually quite limited. Um, and from that, I've tried to pick uh, different research articles that have had some implications that could be used in the eMERGE department. There's very little uh, information out there, especially regarding um, eMERGE specific papers uh, with this. So without further ado, um, so what, what, what exactly are anabolic androgenic steroids. Uh, throughout this presentation, you'll see them just short formed as AAS. I will probably just refer them to as steroids, uh, just uh, for simplicity. So typically just uh, in our body, we have uh, four natural occurring uh, forms that are made. We have the androgens, like our testosterone. We have our corticoids, estrogens, and progesterones. Uh, what makes them androgenic uh, are related to testosterone, having the virilization that's associated with it. And um, anabolic steroids are all kind of from a derivative of testosterone where there's effects that have been seen where you have increased muscle mass, you have the virilization of having more um, male um, characteristics um, and such. Uh, a lot of research uh, in chemistry and whatnot has gone through developing derivatives of testosterone for this purpose. So there's pretty well established evidence that uh, when you take supraphysiologic testosterone doses, uh, doses that are more than used for regular testosterone therapy for hypogonadism, that there is a pretty strong correlation with increasing muscle mass and increasing strength. Uh, there's research on uh, look, comparing bench presses, comparing uh, squats, that, there's, that through, through the, through the uh, board that uh, there's increases when you do take uh, supraphysiologic doses. In terms of um, steroids and how uh, they are taken, usually in three forms, uh, whether it's oral, uh, oil-based, so kind of more transdermally uh, or injectable, uh, usually I am uh, as a depot. Uh, when you take it uh, orally, uh, it usually lasts two to 14 days. And then um, when you inject, it actually stays in your system a bit longer and has effects up to four weeks. So all I mentioned that all these steroids and whatnot come from testosterone and modifications of testosterone. So if you look at the upper left hand corner, uh, that's uh, characteristic um, blueprint of what testosterone is. Testosterone is when you take that R group up here. Uh, can you see my cursor? Uh, hoping you can, but at the R group at the top right, uh, you just have a uh, hydroxyl group there. And then modifications come when you change that R group, you make it longer and longer, and um, you get testosterone that acts for a longer uh, duration. Oral formulations uh, take that R group uh, and typically keep that OH group but it adds a methyl group and, uh, and they do changes throughout the rest of the, the cholesterol structure. 
The main way that uh, anabolic steroids work is that, again, they function as if they act like testosterone. So here, um, this is a bit of a busy diagram, but uh, you have testosterone that's made uh, through your uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, um, where you get about five to seven milligrams produced a day. And then from this, it acts directly towards androgen receptors and estrogen receptors. So directly, if it's just testosterone and acting on androgen receptors, it has this strong effect on increasing muscle size, mass, strength, etc. There's an enzyme here, uh, 5-alpha reductase, that's usually tissue specific that converts testosterone into a molecule called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And this has really strong affinity for androgen receptors that are tissue specific. So uh, androgen receptors that are on prostate or the skin, hair follicles, this will affect them directly in that sense. Similarly, um, testosterone actually uh, also gets uh, converted into estradiol and estrogen-like uh, uh, hormones uh, and have effect that way. So people who abuse testosterone uh, and take it more than a um, uh, uh, physiologic dose end up actually having more estrogen in their system as well and have uh, negative side effects from this. You can imagine that uh, therapies have been developed to kind of uh, counteract uh, the effects of these enzymes so uh, these side effects uh, don't occur. Um, when testosterone or an anabolic steroids gets metabolized, it's usually done by the liver uh, and then it's excreted renally. The difficult thing too is with the different anabolic steroids that are uh, produced, there's over 40 of them. Um, although they all act towards these receptors similarly, they get metabolized in very different ways. So uh, for some people who have developed them um, for purposes of sports doping, they've tried to produce them in a way that uh, the traditional tests that you do on a urine test or whatnot, the metabolites wouldn't be detected with these more novel um, uh, compounds. So testosterone replacement therapy. Um, so in general, uh, our testosterone levels fall uh, once you turn 40 every year, about uh, 1.6 to 3%. Um, so there's a role for testosterone therapy to prevent the side effects that come from this. You get these hypogonadal symptoms uh, and uh, individuals like Dr. Van Noom regularly uh, see patients like this to help uh, counteract the uh, onset of these side effects. So for clinical use, uh, testosterone is prescribed uh, in an attempt to uh, restore physiologic doses uh, or levels, sorry, and to um, to minimize any hypogonadal symptoms. And, and so some, some reasons they would do that would be for increasing muscle mass, to help with erectile dysfunction, improving mood, uh, improving libido, and uh, for some transgender care. For the purposes of this talk, this is not what I'm talking about. When I talk about anabolic steroid and anabolic steroid abuse, uh, the doses that people are taking are supra-physiologic. They're much more than what you would clinically be taking for someone that is exhibiting hypogonadal symptoms. So for instance, speaking with Dr. Van Oom, uh, he had mentioned that uh, maybe a starting dose for a patient could be around 50, maybe up to 150 of testosterone uh, as a IM injection. People in this, uh, people who abuse it can take up to 1,000 milligrams of this dose. So uh, almost a tenfold increase uh, for that. In addition to this, uh, this talk, unfortunately, doesn't talk about uh, any doping for sports or any other uh, um, substance like human gro growth hormone that's commonly used uh, and abused as well. So before I can take a step forward, I want to take a little bit of a step back and go through the history of testosterone and anabolic steroids. So in the 30s, this group of scientists actually did quite a bit of work with sex hormones, and they were, after, they were able to synthesize testosterone. This won them the Nobel Prize in 1939. After this, a lot of uh, chemistry work uh, went under the, underway, and more and more anabolic androgenic steroids were developed. They were trying to find ways to modify testosterone and try to isolate more of the anabolic effects versus the androgenic effects. And this really led the way for all the different steroids that are uh, developed and used uh, and abused uh, to this day. In 1958, uh, the FDA in the US uh, approved one of these 
anabolic steroids, Dianabol, as a treatment for hypogonadism. And this really opened the doors for further development and further use of uh, anabolic steroids. By the mid 1960s, uh, they found that this could actually be used in sports. And I think it was 1962 or so, um, a cyclist, a UK cyclist, actually died in the Tour de France. And this is when doping became an actual thing that was defined and recognized in sports. By 1974, the Olympic Committee bans the use of uh, androgenic steroids, and, sorry, androgenic anabolic steroids, and then by 1984, they even banned the use of testosterone. You can recall that by 1988, Ben Johnson broke the world record for his 100-meter sprint, and he was stripped of his gold medal because he had tested positive. What's uh, interesting, too, is around this time in the 80s and 90s, recreational use of uh, testosterone and anabolic steroids became pretty prevalent. Uh, despite it becoming illegal in the States in the 80s, uh, around this time, you had the boom of bodybuilding. You had uh, things like professional wrestling, WWF at the time. This was their golden era where uh, their company really soared at this time. You had action stars like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, really um, uh, being uh, visible on TV and, so, and, and the media and whatnot. And so this kind of paved the way for further abuse of um, uh, testosterone and anabolic steroids. So you compare, you compare that to now, and I was looking up some stats, and if you look at things today, the fitness industry um, has become something that's uh, quite prevalent and quite lucrative. Um, Business Insider uh, estimated that the industry is worth $100 billion. And these two other websites who are marketing uh, statistic uh, websites have showed that there's just continued growth of uh, the fitness industry. With the fitness industry, you have thoughts of self-image, you have thoughts of what uh, uh, appropriate physique should be like, and this is something that uh, is perpetuated in society. So you look towards what's different from now to back then, you have the boom of social media. You have Instagram um, influencers, and uh, I bring these two gentlemen up as example, that two guys that are into fitness, these guys have four million followers. That's almost as much as our prime minister, um, and again, they influence uh, many individuals in uh, what they do. Um, you have someone here, uh, Kayla it's, it's Inez. Um She's a uh, Australian personal trainer, mom, and she releases workout videos and diets. She has 12 and a half million viewers, or sorry, uh, followers. And then you have someone like Summer Rae who is, uh, has some fitness involved and she has 25 million uh, followers as well. And then you have the granddaddy of them all. You have Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who's got endless followers, who all of them have uh, this um, predisposition to help uh, influence others towards fitness, uh, bodybuilding, uh, and physique. So is what I'm talking about just mumbo jumbo, or is there something that I can back this up? So um, one, one of the only meta-analyses uh, that I found related to anabolic steroid use was actually looking at the epidemiology of this. And this actually surprised me quite a bit. Uh, this author looked at about 270 papers that have um, been published from 1970 to 2010, uh, looking at people who had used uh, anabolic uh, steroids. Uh, their goal was to see what the lifetime prevalence, just if anyone has ever used it once in their life, what that would be. Through all the papers, they estimated about 2.1 million patients or individuals uh, were interviewed or surveyed, and they, uh, they had proposed that the lifetime prevalence would be about 3.3% in the world. So uh, um, you see 6.4% in men and 1.6% in women. Uh, and then we look at the global statistics, uh, North America uh, actually ended up having quite similar to the global average. I found that quite surprising that uh, I didn't think it would be this high. Uh, I didn't think that, you know, three in a hundred people would have uh, done some type of steroid in their lifetime. So this definitely was a bit surprising for me. What's interesting in this article as well is they kind of looked at the people that were doing uh, anabolic steroids. And one might think that it's those big, uh, bulky bodybuilders, it's the elite athletes that you see. But no, what's uh, actually more prevalent is that uh, people who are just 
doing, working out, uh, playing sports recreationally are the more common individuals to do this. Um, what also was kind of uh, was a bit uh, unique was that I noticed that high school uh, uh, students uh, had, um, uh, I guess, higher than expected levels of uh, people abusing steroids as well. And then I think the author commented that um, particularly the reason why this would be would uh, be for twofold. One, that uh, this time of life body image is uh, pretty important. And two, a lot of high schools, especially in the United States, have this um, strong pressure into getting scholarships and whatnot. And so a lot of uh, high school individuals tend to look for other performance enhancing drugs to help uh, give them the edge to make that cut. So yeah, so 3%, 6.4% in men, 1.6% in women, found that a bit uh, interesting. All right, so we talked about steroids. Now, how exactly do people use steroids? So um, there's some slang and some things that are done that I want to talk over. So the first thing to know is about cycling. So what cycling is, is um, going on um, a set pattern of use for a set amount of time, but then abstaining from use uh, as well. So the, the purpose of doing this is you're using it for some time, then you stop, and you really just want to uh, prevent your hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access to be able to recover so that's not chronically suppressed. They want to minimize the negative uh, feedback inhibition that would happen if you were to use it continuously. So when you talk to people who abuse uh, steroids, uh, they're either on cycle or off cycle. Uh, people also do what's called pyramiding, where they gradually build up their uh, dose of testosterone or other steroid and then gradually come down for it. And the way they do, is, do that is they want to continuously almost shock their body so they can gradually have uh, more anabolic gains and then minimize the side effects that come with it. Uh, people who abuse steroids also do what's called stacking. So commonly you'll see people not just use one, um, one hormone or one drug. They don't just use testosterone. They often use multiple things at uh, one time. So you can imagine this becomes quite tricky from a uh, doctor-patient relationship because it's hard to figure out exactly how much uh, they're using and, and, and what the dose is equivalent to. Uh, they stack because they don't want to uh, develop tolerance for uh, a, a certain drug. Um, and so just uh, it's noted that just your endogenous uh, production, uh, production of testosterone in men is roughly 5 to 10 milligrams. In women, it's much less. Uh, it's a fraction of that, about 1 milligram. And then uh, a study that looked at people who are abusing um, steroids, how much they actually are doing. The, act, the, the average of um, how many different drugs they're doing is actually about three agents, and cycles usually last 10 weeks. And the dosing is usually five to 29 times greater than the physiologic replacement dose, which is quite, quite intense. Um, most people don't use this for a prolonged, prolonged time over years and years. They have a set amount of time with a cumulative uh, exposure time of about a year. And then when people do use it for shorter amounts of time, less adverse side effects uh, have been noted. So with this, are steroids even legal? So Looking up the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, so anabolic steroids and all the derivatives, there's 43 that's listed. They're listed as a Schedule Four drug. This is the same class as a benzodiazepine. So what this means is if you are in possession of it, if you're using it, it is not a criminal offense to do that. However, once you start selling it, uh, it becomes bad news and it becomes even worse news if you sell it or produce it and try to export it. So. Uh, in short, buying and using it's okay, but selling it is not. So the good thing is anabolic steroids are hard to get, right? And this is absolutely not true. So I think I thought that uh, people that get anabolic steroids would be somewhere in a gym locker room where you get it from a seedy looking individual that's in a tracksuit or something. This is absolutely not the case. I went on Google. I typed in buy anabolic steroids Canada. I clicked on the first link that you can find. It's called Steroids Online Canada. You can buy any type of steroid you want, injectable, oral, um, other ones. You can buy needles if you want, uh, and it's pretty much all available. When you go into their FAQs, there's even a question is, is there a risk of having your material seized? Impossible 
All milk shipped within Canada does not go through customs, therefore domestic milk cannot be seized. Moreover, by federal law, domestic milk can only be opened by the receiver. So number one, I do not endorse using any of this stuff or doing any of this, but it's pretty easy for the public to get their hands on this if they really wanted to. So all this is good and, and, and whatnot. Now clinically, you know, what, what, what happens? What do we do? How do we suspect someone that is abusing uh, anabolic steroids? So a lot of the physical findings you'll see are secondary to having this supraphysiologic dose of uh, testosterone or the anabolic steroid and the side effects that come from it. So for men, uh, first looking at dermatologic stuff, you get increased acne production. So testosterone, specifically DHT, uh, acts to help to produce more sebum. Uh, and with sebum, you get, uh, the, um, get more acne production. Interestingly, in adults that do take uh, steroids, the acne isn't on your face like when you experience it during puberty or whatnot. It's typically seen over the trunk or the back. Some people call it even backne. You can see in this first picture there. Uh, testosterone has direct effects on hair cells. So um, with excess amounts, you can get balding um, that's present. Uh, with regards to gynecomastia, if you recall to that, that blue slide that I had, um, that, that testosterone does get converted to estradiol and its uh, effects. And especially, again, if you're having exogenous testosterone that's given to you, you're having a lot of testosterone, but some of it and more of it than normal will be converted to an estrogen-like hormone. And as a result, uh, this can get affected. Uh, this can cause gynecomastia and whatnot. Uh, you can have smaller testes from excess testosterone. You can have prostatic enlargement, um, again, with that DHT molecule. And you see uh, increased muscle mass as well. Um, I, I want to mention that this... It, Although quite a few men uh, who abuse uh, testosterone, testosterone or steroids can look like this, it's not the only appearance they can have. A lot of people can have more um, cut look or more shredded look with uh, less, with more lean mass and not so bulkiness uh, as well. So it's, uh, it's good to, to have all these on your radar when you see someone that you might suspect. In regards to smaller testes and prostatic enlargement, I don't know if you guys want to routinely do that in the emergency department. Uh, with regards to females, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, so uh, they get a lot of virilizing effects from testosterone. Um, so you can see increased facial and body hair as depicted in this picture, decreased breast size. You can get clitoral enlargement as well. Again, I don't know if you want to be doing that uh, per se in the ED for no other good reason. Um, deep in voice is a very common side effect and this one's uh, typically irreversible. And I want to make a comment on women that do um, uh, anabolic steroids that I think there's a preconceived notion that they look like this picture on the bottom left here that they're uh, very muscular and very large uh, individuals when I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think this is one end of the spectrum that uh, someone, for someone to look like this, they have to be doing some pretty heavy stuff. And I think um, the goal for women that do do it, they look for a body more like towards the right where they are, have more lean muscle mass, that they are uh, more um, cut uh, and they're not particularly looking more bulky. So I'd say that uh, doing this, uh, or looking towards these findings would be a bit more accurate. Um, so what complicates this even further is with all those side effects, uh, the community of people who do do uh, anabolic steroids um, have had um, various drugs that they co-ingest to minimize the side effects. So you literally will have men who are on an estrogen receptor modulator like tamoxifen who doesn't have breast cancer to minimize the effect of developing gynecomastia. You'll have people on finasteride to minimize the, pros the, the hair loss or prostatic enlargement that they have. You'll have people on Lasix because of some side effects of water edema. You'll have individuals on beta HCG uh, to help uh, stimulate more testosterone, bro uh, more testosterone production or uh, help with their infertility. So it's very, very complicated that some of these physical findings you might not see in someone that's quite involved in their um, anabolic steroid abuse. 
So what other things can we find in the ED that might lead us towards thinking someone is using uh, testosterone or steroids? So one thing that's actually quite unique is that you end up seeing some erythropoiesis. You'll see an elevated hematocrit and hemoglobin. And this is thought because testosterone has a direct effect on erythrocyte proliferation through an unknown mechanism. It decreases uh, hepcidin, which of, uh, increases iron availability to make more uh, red blood cells, and then its uh, effects with estradiol seems to stimulate bone marrow growth to help with um, hemoglobin uh, production. So aside from that, uh, testosterone uh, is, is known as the one thing that helps um, in puberty to really bump up hemoglobin uh, and keeps it lar uh, higher in uh, you gonadal men compared to women uh, over the term of their life. So I think when you look at hematocrit and hemoglobin, there's only a few things that really can cause this to be elevated. I think most commonly in the ED, you have to make sure that they're not volume contracted and this is just a relative increase that you see. But other absolute things would be like if they are hypoxic and they increase their production, if they have a history of polycythema, uh, ribavera, or they have known renal cysts or tumors, those would potentially stimulate uh, more uh, red blood cell production. But other than that, really, there's not many things that can increase this, maybe COVID as well. Um, but um, this is something that I recommend that at least everyone that you're suspicious of, at least have a CBC done to see if uh, uh, this is something that's on the board. So I kind of jumped back and forth with physical findings and uh, lab work. Um, and I kind of left this for the last, last part with regards to the approach and the patient interaction. So this patient population is actually very interesting and unique, and the interactions can be a bit challenging. For one, when you talk to someone that um, is on anabolic steroids, typically they don't like to disclose their use for stigma that they're cheating, for the stigma that uh, this is a taboo thing, that there might be legal um, issues associated with it. Patients do not like to willingly disclose that they're on, on steroids. The second thing is there's actually quite a lot of studies looking at how uh, patients um, view physicians um, with regards to when, how they approach patients with steroid use. And quite a few of them don't disclose uh, to physicians because they don't trust their knowledge of it. And I think this is a pretty fair statement. How many of you uh, knew about the stuff that I've been talking about thus far? I didn't know most of this before reading into all this. So um, it is something that I think a lot of physicians aren't well educated on. The, the studies have looked at this. They, patients have ranked physicians' knowledge on illicit drugs, tobacco, alcohol, et cetera, to be quite well. But then when it comes to anabolic steroids, they're consistently uh, deemed to be quite poor. And I think the most unique uh, aspect of dealing with someone that uh, is on anabolic steroids is the fact that the role that you're in gets kind of flipped or reversed. And you might encounter someone that actually knows more about this topic than you do. Uh, a lot of people that are invested in anabolic steroid use uh, do research uh, a lot of it quite deeply and, sorry, quite, they, they research it quite, quite a bit, although it might be a bit more superficial. Superficial in the sense that they think they know everything about it, but don't really know the deeper consequences associated with it. There's a wealth of information you can find online and on forums. If you use Reddit, there's subreddits that you can go on that tell you about it. So, the information that people have about this is actually quite plentiful online about how to use it. Um, and I'll just say the recommendation for this is that if you approach someone who is uh, that someone that you suspect using this, um, to not be judgmental, and then you actually have to actively inquire to, to help uh, dig this out. I think um, on top of this is having some basic knowledge regarding um, uh, uh, anabolic steroids will help open the door a bit. So I'm going to transition over and kind of start talking about the medicine behind this and what steroids do and some of the effects it has in the ED. But I want to preface all this that their information in the literature is quite limited. Um, a lot of the studies that have been published, there's a lot of case reports, a lot of case series, some uh, observational studies, and very few randomized control trials or anything like that. Um, I think it's limited for a few reasons. Um, I think the public uh, believes that this anabolic steroids affects a very small population. They deem it's for the athletes, the people that are doping, and not recreational use of the general public. Uh, on top of that, research itself in 
uh, and doing these controlled studies uh, is challenging from an ethical standpoint. How easy is it to get ethical approval, approval uh, for a study that you want to give someone a supra physiologic dose of testosterone? Uh, these days it would be quite challenging. And I think the other thing is uh, the age and the timing of things that uh, recreational steroid use was really prevalent done in the 80s and 90s. So a lot of the long-term effects that you uh, want to see with that uh, and with the pathology you get with aging would not have been developed in the past 10 years or the past 20 years. That These are things that would be creeping up now when they're uh, typically in their 50s now. So uh, I've dug up a few things uh, in the literature that uh, might influence the ED. Um, I present a case for each one, and all these cases are actually case reports that you can find in the literature, and I've referenced them here. So first case, 30-year-old male presents to the ED with acute episode of severe substernal pain. Uh, it started 30 minutes ago while he was taking a shower. He had some associated diaphoresis. No past medical history, no family history of cardiac disease. Uh, he's a former boxer, uh, but recently has been rigorously training for a bodybuilding competition in the past four months. He ultimately discloses to you that he has been taking some anabolic steroids for the past two months. He's been taking this sinozolol, which is an oral anabolic steroid, and then uh, straight up testosterone, 500 milligrams uh, injected to his muscle weekly. The ECG you get is this one that's seen on the right. You can see some ST elevation in the anterior leads and some in the inferior leads. Uh, he ends up going to the cath lab and uh, in his coronaries, uh, there's quite a bit of, there's not uh, that much uh, atherosclerosis, but there's uh, quite significant thrombosis that's seen in his LED. So the first topic I want to cover is cardiovascular disease and anabolic steroids. Um, one of the more established uh, side effects of anabolic steroids is actually atherosclerosis. Um, so in several studies, they've looked uh, at anabolic steroid users and they've noted to have significantly higher LDL, bad cholesterol, and lower HDL, good cholesterol, than uh, a population of non-abusers. Uh, They've been seeing in various studies, they've seen LDL increase as much as 20% and HDL to levels of 20 to 70%. Um, there was a case report of a pretty young gentleman, I think he was in his late 20s. He had LDL levels as high as 15.4 millimoles and HDL as low as 0 0.36. What's interesting about this, uh, again, he had no family history of anything similar, but what's interesting about this was that when he stopped uh, taking anabolic steroids, within a few weeks, I think it was like five to six weeks, his levels halved on their own without doing anything else. Uh, individuals that take anabolic steroids, you typically see the cholesterol changes within uh, nine weeks. Uh, and the oral formulation, the oral anabolic steroids are particularly bad. Um, you'll see for the rest of the presentation, a lot of the bad stuff does come from the oral um, form of it. And I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, some estimates have uh, thought that the coronary artery disease risk increases by three to six fold. Um, the bottom line with this is that you can see reversibility with stopping it, but it really depends on how much you've been dosing and how long you've been doing it for. So moving kind of on the further end of that spectrum, regards to acute coronary syndrome, there's several case reports um, linking uh, anabolic steroids use and early MI. So if you look at this, this is a, just a collection of different case reports. The age of these people are like awfully young, they're in their 20s, 30s, and low 40s. Uh, they've been bodybuilding, they've used all these different types of steroids that are present, um, and the duration varies as well. And then you have this mixed picture of having, uh, after the PCI, there's either thrombosis, there's either or atherosclerosis, or they have normal coronaries. And although this is just a collection of case reports, I'd say that the literature uh, grossly underestimates uh, this finding. Dr. Van Noom, when I was chatting with him, had said that he recently got referred a case similar like this uh, from uh, cardiology at UH a few weeks ago. So it's definitely something that you do see. Um, the reason, the thought behind, oops, the uh, thought behind why anabolic steroids cause 
acute coronary syndrome um, is threefold. Uh, one, I already mentioned that uh, there's an impact on atherosclerosis with the high LDL and the low HDL that you see with abuse. Um, second, you see um, testosterone directly affects uh, thromboxin A2, which ultimately increases platelet aggregation. So it puts you at a pro thrombotic states. This explains that chart previously that some of the coronary show just thrombosis. On the other side of things, um, testosterone also has been seen to inhibit guanylate cyclase. And largely what, this, what the downstream effect of this is, is it inhibits smooth muscle relaxation and you get this coronary vasospasm, kind of similar to what you see with cocaine use. Um, and it could explain the findings that you see with these PCIs where uh, the coronaries look fine, but they still have uh, a worrisome presentation. So this combination of all three of these um, are attributable to this, uh, the, the cardiac effects we see there. Um, other things that you see is you see a cardiomyopathy on a few post-mortem studies uh, and looking at men who had uh, either known anabolic steroid use uh, from history or just significant elevated levels on autopsy. Um, their heart findings that, or that they found that most of them had uh, enlarged or heavier hearts than the typical, popula typical population adjusted for body mass, age, and any history of trauma. Um, with these findings uh, in the literature, there was a debate on whether or not these are true findings that are related to anabolic steroid use or the population they're studying. And what I mean by that is uh, the population, bodybuilding, weightlifters, and whatnot. In these particular uh, patients, you do see a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that develops called athlete's heart, where you see this symmetric thickening of the walls, um, but it's the thickening is usually uh, less than 12 millimeters. Other studies that have looked directly into this, they found that individuals that have had uh, steroid abuse, the thickening they see is very asymmetric. They see in the septal wall or they see in the posterior wall, um, and it's not symmetric as seen, and they're usually more thick, or sorry, the, 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 the diameter's uh, yeah, a bit bigger. Um, the thought behind this is that testosterone directly increases uh, fibrosis in the myocardium at super physiologic doses. Um, there's also been studies that looked at um, ejection fraction and LV function. Um, in this study, there's a 2017 study that was done, and I, I, I apologize because I realize a lot of these citations are actually in my presenter's notes and not directly beside the points, uh, but I can uh, attach that on a PDF or a PowerPoint if needed. Um, so anyways, this study um, uh, showed that um, in 2017, there was actually, they compared, they, looked, they, they recruited um, individuals that had known use of uh, anabolic steroids for at least two years. There were known bodybuilders. The age was about 35 to 55, compared to other bodybuilders who had just had never done this. And looking at echoes, there was a significant difference uh, with individuals that had been actively taking the drug uh, versus uh, people that had never done it. There was a difference of the ejection fraction of 82% to 63%. Good thing is that uh, with uh, heart failure therapy that they did um, improve their function after six months. In shorter term studies, uh, people that have not used as long as two years, people that have done short stints of anabolic steroids, they don't see the same effect on their EF. So bottom line, lots of cardio, cardiac issues. Atherosclerosis is one of the big things um, to look out for. Um, with this population, there's definitely a link towards, uh, sorry, there is a link towards uh, ACS and uh, anabolic steroid abuse. Usually this is actually dose dependent as well. So case two, a uh, 56 year old male uh, has a 10 day history of right calf swelling and shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, Non-smoker, no recent surgery, no mobilization, no previous thrombosis, no malignant history. Uh, physical exam, vitals are fine. Uh, you see a red swollen calf, do an ultrasound. There's a thrombus in the right popliteal vein and the CT reveals a bilateral submassive PE. Uh, the steroid history of this is a bit unique and a bit kind of, uh, it made me scratch my head a bit. So the story with this guy was that six weeks prior, he was at the gym, he injured his shoulder and then went to go see an orthopod. This is in Europe. Uh, the orthopod gave him two cortisone injections. I think it was Supraspinatus uh, was what they thought was the injury. Um, they gave them two shut injections around there, uh, one week apart for each, no effect. And then ortho gave him 
1250 of testosterone and 150 of nandrolone, which is another anabolic steroid weekly for three weeks. And so uh, I'm not sure why this was done. And this, the paper doesn't really state that either. I looked up some other stuff that for pre-op planning, there's been some cases where they give high doses of testosterone to help uh, maintain the uh, muscular mass. But yeah, so they got this really high dose of testosterone uh, and the anabolic steroid. And then after the third set of injections, you develop these shortness of breath symptoms. I want to note that after you got admitted and treated for the PE, they also did do a pretty extensive um, uh, hypercoagulable workup uh, and all those uh, markers were found to be negative, protein CS, antithrombin, all those other uh, underlying conditions were, were found negative for this gentleman. Um, so with regards to literature on venous thromboembolism, there's case reports that do uh, have a correlation with use and the proposed mechanism is threefold as well. Uh, I previously mentioned that you have that elevated hemoglobin hematocrit that the erythropoiesis you see causes a more viscous blood and then, then there's been um, uh, studies that showed that hematocrits above 52%, 0 0.52, uh, typically predisposes you to uh, VTE. Uh, other proposed mechanism is that you're at a more hypercoagulable state when you're on testosterone. Again, I mentioned that you have platelet aggregation because testosterone increases thromboxin A2. Uh, and other related studies, people that have been dosed with oral steroid uh, have shown that coagulation factors in their blood were increased, including uh, plasmogen. Uh, the third uh, factor that could increase uh, your risk for VT is that um, in, uh, as you can recall, that the estrogen conversion of testosterone and, you know, estrogen is, uh, has been seen to be a risk factor. Case three. Uh, so in case three, there's a 25-year-old male that presents with a two-week history of lethargy, anorexia, jaundice. Uh, investigations, I've LHSC'd these colors. So you have uh, elevated billy and mild, uh, mildly elevated transaminases, but your albumin's fine, your INR's fine. Uh, extended liver screens, so looking at your hepatitis markers, um, looking at uh, ceruloplasm and all that stuff, normal. Ultrasound, unremarkable. CT abdo, unremarkable. He mentions he's been taking an oral steroid for the last three weeks, and his last dose was about four weeks ago. So this isn't really a emergency per se, but it is a very common finding that you see in individuals that take oral steroids. Uh, specifically the oral steroids, the seven alpha, alpha the, the oral steroids for whatever reason have a very hard time with first pass metabolism. So it's decreased and it sits around longer and, and, and it causes some uh, liver toxicity that's associated with it. So these people get symptoms one to four months after use, and it's this really slow onset of nausea, fatigue, itchiness, and then you get the dark urine and jaundice that, you, that follows it. Um, the labs, you get elevated ability with mildly elevated amino transfer, uh, your, um, your liver enzymes, uh, and typically these guys don't have abdominal pain or anything of the sort. In individuals that end up getting a liver biopsy, they get what's called bland cholestasis, which is just really cholestasis in the cells they see with nothing else really surrounding it. The treatment of this is supportive. You just give antihistamines to help with pruritus. With regards to cholestasis, there's been treatment uh, proposed with ursodiol and cholestyramine. And this is also one of the co-ingestions that some uh, abusers take to prevent this, but largely the treatment is stopping uh, the uh, steroid. Some authors have proposed that if you see someone with this type of syndrome, you can almost uh, be assured that they are abusing a steroid of some sort, even if they don't disclose it to you and there's no other findings that uh, make sense towards why this would happen. Uh, another thing that you see with oral steroids typically is um, you, see, you can see hepatic tumors. Um, this is usually either a benign hepatocellular adenoma or a hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, the reason behind this is your liver has uh, receptors for testosterone and um, estrogen. Uh, and the, the main thing I want to say about this is with the benign ones, you usually don't do anything about it. It has a potential to become more malignant and become the hepatocellular carcinoma. This one's really bad. Uh, men are more prone to have this, but the case reports related to this aren't that good. They all have uh, other risk factors that might be contributing to why uh, they develop it, and not just uh, steroid use. Uh, case four, um, 
A 25-year-old man presents to the ED with red brown urine and general my myalgias. Three days prior, he bench pressed 350 pounds 15 times in the span of 20 minutes. He states he normally only does 250 pounds in the same amount of time and time frame. Uh, the day after, he had persistent pain all over, really bad in his chest. He couldn't even get out of the bed and stayed in bed for 24 hours and just took Tylenol. Uh, vital stable when he presents the eMERGE. His CK is 38,000, uh, mildly elevated potassium. Creatinine is fine, and he has a urine myoglobin of 18,000. He gets admitted for rhabdomyolysis, and his urine is alkalized with a normal saline bicarb. Uh, and with the note of this um, patient, uh, two weeks prior, he said that his friend gave him some oral uh, drug to help him get bigger, but he doesn't know what it is. Um, so with regards to rhabdomyolysis and ten tendon ruptures, very, very few papers talk about rhabdomyolysis, but I bring this up because mechanistically this makes sense and it's something to potentially watch out for. Someone that is taking a drug to make them stronger, make them lift more, uh, it seems like a good cocktail for potentially developing rhabdomyolysis, especially if they're overexerting themselves. Uh, one thing that's seen in literature quite a bit is tendon ruptures are quite common with anabolic steroid use. Um, more so because of uh, two mechanisms that are thought of. They think that with anabolic steroid use, you have defined muscular hypertrophy, but they think that with this uh, growth of the muscle, the tendon actually stays the same. So the tendon ends up getting more overloaded and overworked than normal, and it predisposes them to rupture. Um, and with um, anabolic steroids, uh, they, or the other thought is that the anabolic steroids directly is toxic to the tendon. Um, the only cross-sectional study that they had with regards to tendon rupture is that uh, this author looked at bodybuilders who had a significant bodybuilding history in anabolic steroid use, uh, and they compared it to a similar group just by interviews uh, and questionnaires, and they found that the anabolic steroid group said, uh, had mentioned that there was about a 22% uh, increase, or sorry, 22% rate of tendon rupture compared to people that did not use um, anabolic steroids. And what's interesting about this report is in that group that did, did do steroids, upper body tendon ruptures, like your triceps, your chest, your biceps, that was almost exclusively seen in people that did uh, steroids. So my last case I want to bring up uh, relates to this gentleman. Uh, some of you may know or remember him. Uh, his name is Chris Benoit. He is a Canadian wrestler, uh, was quite prominent in the WWE, he had many championships. Uh, in 2007, uh, there was a case they found that um, they found his body dead at his home. He had found to strangle his wife and uh, also suffocate his seven-year-old son before he hung himself. Uh, and then on his autopsy, they found 10 times levels of physiologic testosterone in his body, um, some benzos in the system. And there was a question of whether or not roid rage, this thing called roid rage, was the reason behind this. Um, on scanning of his, or on autopsy of his brain, they also noted that he had pretty bad CTE, uh, profound atrophy that was through his brain from years of wrestling assume presumably. Um, so it was a bit confounding of what caused what, or both. So the last part I want to talk about is the psychiatric effects of uh, steroid use. This is also a very well established um, uh, aspect that's in the literature. So since the 80s, uh, anabolic steroid use has been associated with major mood disorders. Um, the studies that have been, uh, have, have looked at this have thought that people who are actively using steroids typically develop more hypomanic manic symptoms. And then once they stop or they go off cycle, they then develop um, more uh, depression symptoms. A Swedish study that um, looked at an anti-doping hotline that was available to people who were worried about current use or were inquiring about uh, related use um, had found about 4,000 patients had called in and they talked about the different symptoms they had. And by far, compared to everything else, aggressiveness and depression were the most common symptoms that were elicited. So, um, a particular author, Harrison Pope, he's, a, he's considered one of the most cited uh, psychiatrists in the 20th century. He's a Harvard psychiatrist. He's looked into quite a bit on substance abuse and psychiatric disorders, and he's looked into, he's done studies with um, anabolic steroids. 
and his, his findings was that typically in individuals that take more than one gram weekly of testosterone or similar uh, anabolic steroid, this is when um, the big, bad, and ugly stuff happened with uh, psychiatric conditions. His study, he recruited uh, several bodybuilders from gyms, looking at people who were using, people that were not using, and they found that with the dose relationship, people that were using uh, 300 to 1,000 times per, uh, milligrams per week or more than 1,000 milligrams per week, that there was definitely an increase of people that would get uh, hypomanic, manic, or depressed uh, mood states all kind of clumped together. Um, it was, when we broke it down, it was about 12% we get uh, hypomanic manic states and about 11% we get depression. Only 3.4% 3.4% got psychotic symptoms. Uh, they repeated this uh, study in women and they found interestingly that it wasn't really uh, um, hypomanic or manic states that they were getting, but they were more getting depression as a side effect. And then within the paper, he looked at other studies that had, do had been done and looked at um, dosing and they thought that increased dose was uh, a risk for increasing uh, symptoms. So what about roid rage in particular? In most of these studies, they, they comment on the hypomania, the mania that they experience. It's actually quite unique. Usually it's not so much the euphoria that they get, but they actually get more of a violent or aggressive uh, kind of subtype that, that develops. And in the paper, they actually comment on some of the behaviors that they were exhibiting. And I found that some of them to be quite aberrant and quite, quite unique. So some things that were notable that there was a guy that ended up damaging three cars by punching them and using a metal bar while the driver were all inside still, uh, all because there was a traffic delay. There's people that got into... Uh, fights and property damage at sporting events. There's people that rammed their head through a wooden door. There's people that nearly completed a successful murder plot. The study doesn't elicit any more details about that. And there's people that even like beat and almost killed their their pets. Um, so it comments on on that, and it was a, a unique finding that the aggression is what you see coming with these states. Um, more so, more the, more, uh, the other stuff, I'm kind of running out of time, so I want to speed through this, that um, they tried doing studies where they actually gave um, random, uh, they gave a super physiologic dose of testosterone, uh, and they did see similar hypomanic um, and man manic states develop but at a much lower rate. So bottom line is that it seems to be more dose dependent. Um, there's been studies that looked at suicide, um, and typically there are after autopsy, the studies that kind of did a psychologic autopsy where they really questioned family members and family members. They found that a lot of them um, had some depressed symptoms while using anabolic steroids. Some had hypomanic states just before they committed suicide. They had a recent acts of violence. And what's inter most interesting is that 88% was found uh, through family members and friends that they did not have any prior uh, suicidal ideation or attempts. Um, the other thing I want to look at is substance abuse. Uh, there is a link towards opioid use uh, and uh, anabolic steroids as well. Um, and the thought is that people are that you are using anabolic steroids are doing so because uh, are are wanting to train hard and train heavy, and they use opioids as a way to minimize the pain so they can keep uh, working through. Uh, so my summary and take-home points is that uh, anabolic steroid use is more common than you think. Uh, if you are suspicious, you need to actively inquire. From a lab perspective in the ED, uh, you should do a CBC at least and really consider if you have a guy that has elevated HCT or hemoglobin without any explained reason. Um, the adverse effects associated with it are usually dose dependent and time dependent. The more they use, the longer they use, the worse it is. These are the systems that I talked about today and their possible effects. And I think the one thing that I take home point with um, the patients you do encounter in the eMERGE is the eMERGE is in the setting for counseling. We're limited by the number of patients we have to see, time constraints and whatnot. I think given the difficult population that you deal with, having just that basic understanding that steroids are bad for you, something more than that, that steroids can cause cardiovascular disease, can cause um, tendon rupture, cause psychiatric symptoms, having that knowledge opens the door for further discussions that patients will have with physicians and establish more trust. Um, and if you have any concerns about that and wanting them to quit, I think it's reasonable to refer to their GP or an endocrinologist. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you. Are there any questions? It was a long talk.
if there's no questions, I thank you for all attending. Oh, I see some comments on the thing. All right, thanks again. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Thanks, Dr. Van Noom, for consulting me about this or having you know, your knowledge imparted here. Thanks, guys.